Okay, take it away, Clifford. Okay, well, it's uh, a pleasure to uh, be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, what an excellent workshop and uh, great to see at least uh, familiar, lots of familiar uh, names and faces in little boxes. Um, so that's quite nice. Sorry about the very long title. Uh, hopefully you'll see why all these elements are in here as, uh, as I go along. So this paper, uh, uh, this talk is based on a paper that came out recently. It's work with Felipe Rosso, a student here at USC, and uh, who, by the way, will be on the job market this year. I hope he's not too embarrassed that I mentioned that. And um, the, uh, the paper number is here. A brief summary is as follows uh, of what's gonna come. So I will uh, give a little motivation, not much needed for this audience, I suspect. Uh, and then I'm going to spend a fair amount of time digging into some old technology that isn't familiar uh, to a number of uh, uh, people who are interested in this subject of random matrix ensembles and the double scaling limit. I need to unpack some, some tools that we're going to use uh, later on. So after I've done that, I'm going to go into my first application, which is to review how to think about JT gravity uh, with these new tools. I will talk about uh, known perturbative results, but then I will also talk about how you can formulate using these tools an alternative uh, to uh, the setup that's familiar from uh, uh, Saad, Schenker, and Stanford so that you can get at non-perturbative information but it is perturbatively equivalent to what they did. And then application number two, which is really the subject of this, uh, this new paper, is to talk about deformations of JT gravity, which as you may have heard, um, a family of them have been shown by authors I'll mention shortly to also have a random matrix ensemble description, but there are some puzzles. And by reviewing these tools, I will show you how to solve these puzzles. And then I'll summarize. So this work supported um, uh, in part by uh, the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. So the key discovery, which uh, has already uh, come up in some discussions has been the observation that you can actually write JT gravity as equivalent to some random matrix model. It's a random matrix model in a double scaling limit. And that fine print is extremely important. This has been generalized. Uh, that the initial work was by Saad, Schenker, and Stanford. It's been generalized uh, by Stanford and Witten uh, to various other kinds of variants of JT gravity, cousins, if you like, uh, in, in this paper. And one of the motivations is that these are, of course, instructive examples of, if you like, a full, fully working quantum theory of gravity where we have, um, we're summing over all space times, uh, geometries and topologies in some, in some way where we can control everything. So that's nice to see and, and worthwhile studying. And then it's also a key example of uh, this averaging phenomenon we've been talking about um, in various guises throughout this workshop and beyond. So the action, uh, for our purposes, I'll simply sketch out uh, the action. Uh, the pieces I'll need in Euclidean uh, presentation are as follows. There's the uh, pure Einstein-Hilbert piece, which all together with the boundary term forms the, um, uh, the Euler um, density, which tells me the topology, sorry, the Euler characteristic, which tells me the topology of the two-dimensional surface that we'll be working on. Uh, I'm calling that chi, and I'll count handles with a uh, little g, and there'll be, for most of this talk, just one boundary b. So things will look like that. And then there's uh, the coupling of the all-important scalar, the dilaton, which uh, couples in this way, such that uh, integrating it out uh, enforces locally that this has a constant negative curvature surface, giving us the almost ADS2 picture that uh, is, is, is described a lot in this context. Uh, the uh, time is um, Euclidean and compact with period beta giving me an inverse temperature and a computation of the disk level partition function um, from the underlying Schwarzian theory uh, um, done 
by Malvison and Stanford and clarified and expanded on by many other teams that I don't have time uh, to mention, I apologize, uh, can be written like this. You can define a spectral density by a Laplace transform, which looks like this. I'll use the notation that I have a little subscript zero to mean leading order, uh, which is disk level in this discussion. I've uh, translated uh, e to the e to the minus s naught into a parameter I'll call h bar, um, a rather cheeky notation, but it will, as you see, correspond to an h bar in a genuine quantum uh, theory in a moment. But it will be the expansion parameter in which you count topology because of how it appears here in the action. So moving on, we have some expansion, which looks like this. I have some, uh, I'd like to have the full story, which is some expansion uh, uh, the, at order uh, counted by G, I have some power of H as I talked about. And that's the perturbative expansion in topology, but also extremely important is the non-perturbative uh, sector, which looks, um, very in, which is very interesting, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go along, and then build it fully later on for you. Similarly, then I can talk about that in terms of the spectral density, where I have a power series of uh, in H bar and then non-perturbative contributions. So the leading order piece I talked about is uh, diagrammatically, well, schematically, keep that sort of diagrammatics in mind. Now. As I said before, uh, the, the, the remarkable result of triple S was that you can actually show that every one of these terms in the expansion is captured by a random matrix model in a double scaling limit. Uh, they do this in uh, a, a, a quite remarkable series of uh, computations where you do the actual supergravity calculation sorry, gravity calculation on one side, the matrix model computation on the other side, and use various recursion relations. Uh, uh, well, the recursion relation, essentially loop equations from the matrix model that are seeded by the, the, uh, the row zero, and then it tells you how to construct all of the others. What that obscures is getting direct access to some non-perturbative intuition about the model. And uh, so that formulation the formulation I'll use here will deliberately be a different one, which will be equivalent to what they do, but will give you more access to the non-perturbative physics. And it is based on a hint uh, that they already give in their paper that there's a way of thinking about this in terms of what are called minimal string theories. And various authors uh, expand, uh, ran with that idea and, and made it into a workable uh, piece of technology. Now, recent work by Witten and by Maxfield and Turiachi, and recently uh, a paper by Turiachi, Usachik, and Wen, uh, Wang, uh, show that there are various deformations of JT gravity, which can be written as random matrix models as well, which is a, a, a significant advance. But there's some very strange behavior that appears in certain parts of the parameter space as you do the deformation. Um, the, the spectral density seems to have regions where it becomes negative, which is very strange because it starts out at the outset of being a positive quantity. So what does that mean? How do you resolve some of these puzzles? And so what I'll tell you is how to do that. And that's the subject of, uh, of the recent paper. So what I need to do, as I promised, is tell you about random matrix models and the double scaling limit. So I, I will be uh, a little bit uh, swift, but I hope to get some of the key ideas because we will need them to understand how to resolve the puzzles. So you start out uh, going back as far as Wigner historically, writing down some, some, uh, some probability distribution for some family of matrices, and they can be n by n Hermitian matrices, but they don't have to be. That'll be important in a moment. And uh, there's some potential, uh, um, which looks like this, if you want to think of it as a zero plus one dimensional field theory. Uh, you can then go ahead and expand uh, in Feynman diagrams in that picture. And uh, what, uh, <clears throat> what Tuft uh, taught us was that the large N diagrammatics is a nice way of capturing topology. So uh, if I were to draw uh, the quartic vertex 
and uh, connect them up with the propagators that we get. We can do this in various ways, count the powers of n that come from the Feynman diagrams of this expansion, and you'll find that at leading order, you can draw um, uh, things on the sphere, uh, at n to the minus two, things uh, can be drawn on the torus, and so on and so forth. So that's a nice way of counting topology. Also, what's going on is by simply dualizing these diagrams, you can actually see that they're equivalent to tessellating the surface that you're drawing them on. So if you actually were to uh, follow through the various identifications, you'll see that I'm essentially tessellating this uh, sphere with a square and uh, similarly uh, the torus with a square identified in different ways and so on and so forth. Now that's a very, very poor approximation to a nice smooth surface, which is what we want to do if we're interested in describing smooth surfaces that are supposed to be some gravity theory. The double scaling limit tells you how to actually get smooth surfaces. That goes back uh, to Brezan Kazakov, Douglas Schenker, and uh, Gross and McDowell. And essentially what you do is you tune, at the same time as you tune to large n, you tune this potential to a place where large surfaces dominate. That corresponds to diagrams where you have lots of vertices and, and, and propagators loops um, making what often are called fishnet diagrams. So if you tune things in such a way that you do that, you will get universal physics coming from the smooth surfaces that don't care about the details of the tessellation. How do you do that? Well, there are various ways of doing it, but schematically, here's how this works. So you can diagonalize M uh, in ways uh, um, that uh, I'm, I'm sure have been described uh, uh, here before. And um, uh, working with the diagonal where I'm putting little tildes on things to distinguish them from energies I'll use later on. I have the energies and there's a um, Vandermond determinant coming from the, uh, which is the Jacobian for doing this change of variables and the overall integral of the unit raise cancel. And uh, the, at large n, see that essentially there's a nice description in terms of what's called a Dyson gas, where you simply have a droplet of the eigenvalues um, located at some particular um, uh, place on the, on the line. And that uh, intuitively comes from the fact that I have uh, from the blue curve here, that's the potential, which is trying to confine these eigenvalues um, toward the middle. But the van der Mond determinant acts as a repulsion between eigenvalues that forces the thing to spread out. And there's some balance. And at large n, you can describe that as this, uh, um, this droplet with, uh, described by this function rho. Now, uh, the double scaling limit turns out to simply focus on the endpoint of, of the density. And uh, uh, the most famous example is the, is the Gaussian case where you just have uh, you just have a Wigner semicircle distribution, which I've uh, written like that. And if you focus on the endpoint, you're just getting for, for small energies, you're getting this square root e behavior. And the critical behavior that you want to get large surfaces uh, comes from actually generalizing this. So in this case, I'm going to call k equals one. And more generally what you can do is you can tune that V so that you have K minus one extra zeros um, at the end point. And so that gives you a behavior of E to the K minus a half. And that K uh, I, will, I will use as a notation later on. In fact, the, the, the smooth surfaces, the theories of smooth surfaces that you get uh, from this were later called minimal string theories, a certain class of minimal string theories, uh, the terminology due to Cyberg, and I think I misspelled his name, sorry, uh, Natty. So uh, I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper than that because I'm gonna need some more tools. Uh, let's go back to the matrix model. Here it is uh, in terms of the energies. And what you can do, and this was uh, carried out very nicely in these beautiful papers in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, is to write everything in terms of orthogonal polynomials. There are n of them that start out as e to the n, um, and, and, uh, and then uh, they're orthogonal with respect to this measure involving your potential. There's some uh, normalization like that. Uh, and I can divide by a square root of that and actually have an orthonormal um, uh, basis uh, for, the, for the polynomials that looks like that. Now, um, the, 
uh, there's a recursion relation which terminates because of the orthogonality that tells me if I have PN and I throw in another factor of E, I'm going to get a piece of uh, PN plus one plus something, something involving uh, a lower PN. And there's uh, a coefficient that I need to work out. And in fact, I can rewrite the entire matrix model in terms of these coefficients. The, the, the information is essentially contained equivalent to, to specifying those. Now, the really nice thing is that you can uh, follow the, all of these quantities to large n, and they give you some very nice uh, tools that we can use to examine the continuum theory. So at large n, I'm going to write the index n divided by n as a smooth parameter x in the large n limit that goes from zero to one. And uh, I'll also define epsilon one over n. And these coefficients become uh, uh, functions uh, a, a of x. It turns out you can write a representation of what that droplet shape looks like, uh, an integral representation that looks like this. And uh, there's, there's some normalization. Uh, integrate over the range of x, uh, this uh, invert, inverted square root function. It ultimately gives you that uh, Wigner piece times some additional polynomial uh, in energies. Now, um, so the endpoints are at x equals zero and one. And as I said, the double scaling limit is uh, to zoom into the endpoints. So you can imagine now I've tuned the potential, as I said, to get that critical behavior that makes uh, large surfaces um, uh, uh, dominate. And that's some particular choice of potential, which is built into what those particular A's are uh, by the definition of the orthogonal polynomials. So now I have to zoom in and the zooming in looks like this. So uh, I can define some parameter delta, which goes to zero in the limit. Some, now I'm go, I look at the end point, uh, the zero end point, and I say X is up to uh, just match my conventions later. There's a minus sign, there's a little X times some power. So as delta goes to zero, this is the end point X equals zero. Uh, this is the, uh, the one over N uh, that goes to zero, a large N. And this is the function A that becomes the endpoint value at, uh, at delta goes to zero. But there's some scaled quantities that I want to focus on. And if I zoom in at the right rate set by these, these numbers, I will be able to actually pick out the, uh, the continuum physics that exists at that endpoint uh, described in terms of these functions. So that's the detailed version of the, uh, of the work of um, uh, these uh, people for, of defining the double scaling limit. You, can, you might wonder what uh, delta is. Uh, intuitively, you can think of it as the size of the triangles or squares that I was um, tessellating the um, quantity, the, the surfaces with. There's one of my fishnet diagrams. I had a phi cube. This is a phi cubed example. It would be squares in the example I wrote before. And I'm sending those to zero in units where I keep uh, uh, fixed uh, my large smooth surfaces. And so I get universal physics as those triangles get um, uh, washed away in the details. And uh, if I pick out universal physics, then it won't matter whether I use triangles, squares, pentagons, et cetera. So that's the, that's, the, that's the picture. We can actually see how it goes for the case model. The scalings uh, go like this up here. And there I am zooming, on the end, zooming in on the endpoint. And I think in the units I'm using, I think I need to divide by a root A zero here. And if I do that and just substitute those in, you'll see that what I get uh, is some nice integral expression pops out. Um, this has gone to zero size. It gets magnified by a factor of N that N essentially becomes the one over H bar uh, times the appropriate powers of Delta that all come from all of these and gives me this nice finite uh, infinite, once infinitesimal, now blown up to be the physics we're interested in at the end point. And so that is uh, the, the leading order, large N, uh, double scale physics. There's a nice picture of this that we're going to use later on. You can see then what I can build is this spectral density function, which looks like this, and it comes from combining these various features. So I have some function U of X, and I ask it what energy, what's going on, and I, I essentially uh, compute this quantity, and then I integrate uh, just where this is real. So this minus infinity is sort of a placeholder for go out as far as you need to until that square root um, uh, vanishes and construct this object. 
and that then builds this spectral density. A nice, uh, a, a nice way of um, keeping track of some of the quantities also to notice that u of zero, u at zero essentially sets the lowest energy, the threshold energy as I'll call it, um, uh, for where the eigenvalue density vanishes. Now, a very important thing to appreciate here is that the x goes to zero physics, which is naively where, well, not naively, which is where the spectral density is supported classically uh, controls perturbation theory. But the x goes to, uh, the, the positive x theory will play a role as well and will control um, non-perturbative physics. So them all working together is what gives you a consistent theory. It's, no, it's important to note that I can also accommodate non-zero thresholds. And that essentially is if I have u at x equals zero being non-zero, then that will define some threshold energy E zero and uh, essentially the same structure uh, works. Now, I'm going to, for later purposes, instead of using x, an x integral, I can instead use u zero as my uh, independent variable in the integral uh, at the expense of this Jacobian f and, and write an integral like that. And uh, I, I'm going to further uh, specialize it as follows. The disk level equation for u will turn out to be of the following form. It'll be written as r, something I'll call r0 uh, equals zero. And that r0 is essentially some function of u plus x equals zero. So a way of writing this integral is simply to replace this f by the derivative of r with respect to u naught. And it's essentially the same thing. And uh, that's just sort of notation, which I use later on. And I've included the possibility of working um, uh, of having some threshold value for you. So that's the expression I'm going to use later on. Now, uh, as you already might have guessed from the fact that uh, I had this nice basis uh, with the, these orthogonal polynomials giving me this nice way of rewriting my matrix integral and rewriting uh, averages of quantities in that matrix interval, I can then sandwich them inside the orthogonal polynomial basis and comp compute in that language. You can see that what's gonna happen is that as I, as I do that large N uh, limit, uh, I get, and I go from N to X, these things have in a sense uh, operators in some, in some theory where these orthogonal polynomials provide me a nice Hilbert space. And there's a real quantum mechanics here as first pointed out in this context by Gross and McDowell, um, that, uh, that is worth working in terms of. And in fact, the energy E, that uh, recursion relation I wrote before for E in this language, in this kind of sandwich becomes in the double scaling limit, an actual Hamiltonian where H bar really is the H bar of the quantum mechanics that this thing defines. This Quantum, this uh, quantum mechanics is defined on all of X, this is H. And then the U is supplied by some nonlinear differential equation that I'll tell you about in a moment, which is often called the string equation. Although there is some confusion in the literature. Sometimes people call the string equation the full thing. And sometimes people call the string equation just the leading order piece. And it's important to distinguish between the two. And I will in this talk. But that string equation, it shouldn't be mysterious, is the continuum limit of identities expressing the content of the matrix model. Once I can write the orthogonal polynomials in terms of their, uh, their, their uh, coefficients a, and those become functions ax, sorry, and those become quantities u of little x, then if I've written everything in terms of the an, the content of the matrix model is a set of equations for the an that become a set of differential equations, uh, difference equations for the an, which become a set of differential equations for the ux. And so that's where the string equation comes from. Okay, a key observable in all of this language, uh, which you might want to ask from the, uh, in the old string theory days, you asked it for uh, good string theory reasons. Um, uh, and uh, in a quantum gravity context, you ask it, uh, because it's a nice observable as well. And now we're seeing it's a natural thing to ask in the JT context as well, is what happens if I have a loop, if I cut a loop on these surfaces that I've been discussing, keep it at fixed length, which I will suggestively call beta, and, uh, and then do the double scaling limit, cream off all the good surfaces 
for which uh, which couple to this uh, beta. And um, these macroscopic loops, um, uh, the formalism for doing that was well, computed by Banks et al. in the early 80s, tells you that you compute the following quantity um, for the uh, for the connected um, diagrams. And it looks like this. And a nice way of thinking about this is that it's some trace over our Hamiltonian H, uh, but there's some projector. The Hamiltonian is defined on the whole line, but I, I, I integrate only up to, uh, from X goes to minus infinity to zero, that place the, which is the classical support of the um, wave function. Uh, uh, sorry, the classical support of the uh, special density. Now I can unpack this thing, which I'm calling this for, uh, uh, again, suggestively, it, I can unpack this thing. I can insert a complete set of, uh, of, of, uh, of wave functions. Uh, and just uh, um, plug that into this, giving me that. And then, uh, uh, and, and, and then uh, um, H operating on those things gives me E. And you can see that what I'm picking out is Psi and Psi star. I integrate over, over them giving me a thing I called rho, I call rho, I have an e to the um, minus beta e left over. That's the uh, spectral density Laplace transformed in exactly the same, structurally the same way. Uh, now we have the theory we started with where I have some sum over random surfaces with some, with some fixed uh, loop of length beta. So this is the thing we need. This is the thing we're going to use to define our gravity theory. And these are now all the ingredients. I have this quantum mechanics. Uh, if I solve, if I fully solve the full quantum mechanics of this, uh, of this problem and construct this beast, I will get the full spectral density perturbatively and non-perturbatively. And so all that is left to do is, is to define what is the Hamiltonian. And, and so, uh, given that I want to get JT gravity, I need to find what is the U, what is that potential that does that? So it depends, it then depends upon which matrix model. It tells me which matrix model to find and uh, that'll tell me what string equations to find. So that's essentially uh, this way of doing JT gravity is a very simple prescription. What it will afford you to do is to actually, by looking at this potential, you can learn a lot about what's going on structurally, both perturbatively and non-perturbatively, just by eyeballing the structure of the potential. So let's do uh, an example. Uh, so our first example is JT gravity. And as I said, um, Triple S already suggested that there ought to be a picture in terms of uh, what they were thinking of as a large K limit of some minimal string theory. Um, I prefer to think of it as, um, uh, uh, an infinite set of minimal string theories coupled together in some combination as made explicit by Okoyama and Sakai um, uh, in, in, uh, in, in this paper, where you sort of, if you just expand this and look, you can see some of that characteristic behavior I was talking about. There's, uh, there's the K equals one model, there's the K equals two model, et cetera. You have an infinite number of them with some particular admixture that you need to turn on. And, and there's a sense in which you can do that precisely because of the structure of the string equations for these minimal string models. Now, leading order, the string equation looks like this. As I, as I said before, this is the R equals zero equation. There's some powers of U times some coefficients TK, and they look like that, uh, e equals minus X. And so I can actually just then use my integral relation I had before uh, and just plug that in. I can compute that Jacobian with that uh, just differentiate this with respect to you, plug that in, off I go. And what you end up with is some particular TK, which is essentially telling you what these different strengths of those different models are that are contributing. Sorry, you can write this in, uh, yes. There's a question, Ta ah. Tarek, do you wanna unmute yourself? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I had a, my question is uh, these Z of betas that you wrote down on your previous slide, is there a sense at all in which they can be thought of as operators on a Hilbert space uh, as like fields on the space of loops? Uh, uh, sorry, I, 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 am, I, am I at the right spot you were talking about? Yes, yes, yeah? exactly, right here. Well, this is, this is to be thought of as the expectation value of a loop of length L. So, um, 
Uh, right, but, I mean, that, yeah. Uh, so I'm, but can, be, but, can they be thought of as operators in, in some Hilbert space? Oh, you mean, uh, can I think of this as creating a loop of length L and then asking what the expectation value is? Uh, yes, yes, with the caveat that I'm doing this projection. So th this connects nicely to some of the discussions we've been having recently where can I just say that this whole gravity theory is controlled by the simple quantum mechanics and, it, uh, uh, and, and there's the nice Hilbert space. And I would say kind of, but you're, you're doing this projection, which, 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 is, which is a huge, you know, you're, 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 you have this larger space and then you're pulling out a subsector. And it, it very, it very much in the spirit of completely different things that Henry was talking about in the previous talk. I, I hope that helps. Um, okay. Yeah, and so, oh. and and if you so if you insert multiple loops, yes. Um, yeah, I guess my my question is, is yeah, is there any anything that could arise that would give you some sense in which there is like a third quantized picture, and these operators may even develop non commutativities in some third quantized type Hilbert space. Oh, I don't know about non-commutativities. I mean, the, the formalism for uh, working out the multiple um, correlators is, is, is very similar to this. You essentially just sandwich more of these, right? You can, you can actually just see, I have, a, I have a Y and then I have another one. This is beta one and I have say an X here. This would be for two of them, beta two H. So that would be two loops and I integrate over Y. Uh, hope, hopefully that's clear. And off I go. So it's very, very well developed. It's all in this paper here. Um, I the the nicest way of thinking about all of this is that there's a very nice. Uh, there's essentially a uh, this is equivalent to a, a picture involving. Uh, it's essentially a, um, a picture involving a gas of free fermions, and essentially these are excitations of the Fermi surface of the uh, of that fermionic description. Uh, I, I would say that second quantized. I, I'm not. I, I never. I'm quite sure what people mean when they say third quantized. Hey, thanks. Okay. There's another question. Uh, Karen Fernandez. You, Hi. You, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, on on your last slide, I mean uh, that expansion. Is it related to the KDV hierarchy that you would normally? Yes. Get in these. Okay. Okay. It, it's 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 just that, or is it any anything? else so uh I, i'm uh by the last slide you mean uh this slide and then i get here maybe i'm not sure what you meant by the last slide but let me answer the question uh, let me just say yes the kdv hierarchy lurks in all of this in ways that um are not important for today's discussion but that you can think of it as a very nice observation uh, a very nice organization of much of the uh, of the structure of the theory, there's an under underlying integrable system, and it is the KDV hierarchy. This, a, uh, this goes back to a beautiful paper long ago uh, by Mike Douglas. Aaron, do you do you want to try and muting again? Sorry. Uh, who? No, don't worry, don't worry, Clifford. Well, there's actually one more question. I I think that we should move along. Okay, uh, I'm getting what, what one more question. Pink, why don't you un unmute yourself? Yeah, I think I already unmute. Okay, so I have a question for here. Here, you said this you regard it as a, a like infinite number of inf uh, inf minimal string models together. Uh, but um, uh, here it seems like the density of a state is just a linear combination of all the minimal string models. But I would say, yes. but does this mean okay? What 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 is uh, what is what what do you really mean by there are infinite many uh, minimal stream models? How how do they couple with each other, uh, or they are decoupled or yeah? They're, they're not how can we see from this linear combination? Point? It it is not linear, and uh, I see what you mean. It is linear in how you uh, so u is the function that defines the theory. Okay, uh, I have to solve this equation. Uh, to get a particular U. So if I add together a bunch of things like uh, a bunch of models like this at leading order, I then solve that polynomial equation and that defines the U for me. And then I put it in here and that gives me a row. So I'm not adding together rows. I'm adding together 
pieces of the equation which I then solve. It gets even more horribly nonlinear, as you'll see in a, in a, in a couple of slides, for the full theory beyond, um, beyond uh, leading order. But even at leading order, you can see that I'm not adding densities. I'm adding pieces to make an equation, which I then solve to give me a row, which is quite different. I should probably move on now. Yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, great questions, everyone. Thank you, and keep them coming. Although I will buy the time back uh, later at the end. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's a nice, you can actually write uh, the, the resulting e equation. Uh, where was I? You can actually write this resulting equation in closed form in this way. And uh, that's going to be quite nice. We'll see generalizations of this uh, coming up later on. Now, let's talk about non perturbative physics, which is uh, something that we also like to get uh, to grips with here. Well, it's also well known, going back to those original papers, that the constituent minimal models, or soon after those original papers, I should say, double scaling papers, the, the, the Hermitian matrix model actually is non perturbatively uh, problematic. And, uh, and you can kind of see it even in the simple prototype k equals one, although it really is a, a, a dangerous illness for, for the e k even one, uh, that if you, if you solve the full non-perturbative problem, you see the spectral density looks like this. So I have the, the, e, the e to the half behavior I talked about. The solid line then are the uh, non-perturbative corrections telling you about the, the underlying discrete spectrum and all of that good stuff coming out. And you can see there's a tunneling there's, a, there's, a, there's an E uh, less than zero contribution, exponentially small, but it's telling you that the eigenvalues, uh, which all you started out with them living uh, at positive E, they actually are tunneling out, uh, destabilizing the whole problem. And that's a problem. And you can see in this language where that comes from. In this simple uh, uh, k equals one model, the exact potential actually just turns out to be u equals minus x. It's this line here. And the wave functions are simply airy functions. And you can see that uh, in constructing the spectral density in the way I gave you the exact spectral density, you do this integral, everything up to here. And so you pick up pieces of, I, of, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the size um, that go into this region. That includes contributions exponentially small because they are doing barrier penetration at e equals to e less than zero, uh, exponentially small, but they do enter this region and give you this contribution. That immediately tells you how to fix this problem. And the way of fixing this problem uh, is thought of in a completely different way um, uh, goes back to uh, work I did um, with uh, Daly and Morris way back in the early 90s, which is that there are other minimal models with the same leading x, goes, uh, x less than zero physics, but better x uh, positive physics. And you can actually obtain those from complex matrix models. And you can uh, carry out in ways I don't have time to describe right now, uh, the same kind of procedures that we talked about uh, but for complex matrix models and get a different set of, uh, of, of, of string equations uh, that will, uh, but perturbatively are the same as these, uh, but are better non-perturbatively behaved. And what I showed last year is how you can use those in these special combinations to define uh, non-perturbative uh, JT gravity definition. Let me show you how it works schematically. Um, well, sorry, not schematically, um, fully uh, for K equals one, but the, the picture sort of generalizes what you have instead of this straight line and then contributions coming in here that uh, are from, zero, from less than zero energy essentially caps off uh, the, the exact solutions. The string equation is R equals zero for the Hermitian matrix model, as I said before, which in this simple case looks like that. Uh, the complex matrix model uses that same quantity R, but you have to solve this larger equation involving it. If I expand it out, it looks like this. It has an asymptotic that looks like u goes to zero here, and then u goes to minus x here. And so you can see that they agree in these regimes where I do perturbation physics, perturbation theory, and then new physics takes over and gives you better non-perturbative behavior. Essentially, you get Bessel functions at lowest energy there, which is rather nice. And so you get that sort of behavior for the spectral density. You can actually do this for real with the full model and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you can look in here uh, for the papers, uh, for the details. Uh, 
The full string equations now, uh, the full non-perturbative string equations look like this. That quantity R looks like this. These Rs, which are indeed the Rs that show up in uh, everyone's favorite uh, uh, KDV hierarchy description. These are the Gelfandiki polynomials. They are polynomials in powers of U and its derivatives. Uh, and there are all sorts of mixed terms and nonlinear polynomials in U. And uh, R equals U is the Hermitian matrix model equations, which is sick. And you can, that same R put into this equation will give you a well-defined uh, non-perturbative sector. So I used these with that combination of TKs that I told you uh, previously uh, to define uh, non-perturbative, beautiful uh, non-perturbative description of uh, JD gravity. And uh, you can actually explicitly solve the equation and uh, some high order truncation uh, where you can solve the nonlinear problem, solve the spectral problem. It's all highly nonlinear, so you have to do it numerically and put it together and you will get explicit. Uh, there's the Wiggles and there's the Schwarzian um, result and there's the non-trivial physics. There's also all sorts of interesting phenomena like uh, a non-zero uh, uh, spectral density at zero energy and things which, which are, uh, give all sorts of interesting non-perturbative phenomena that I don't have time to talk about. I need to tell you about uh, the second application which is the subject of my paper with Felipe Rosso. So these authors, Witten, Maxville, Maxville Turiachi, and Turiachi et al., as I said, uh, produced um, a beautiful story where they studied a class of potentials that looks like this, which have uh, also a matrix model description. I should mention that uh, there's some very nice black hole solutions, not very nice discussion of the black hole solutions of this model, which generalize the ones you get for just um, two phi, uh, the usual u equals zero case. So it worked out nicely um, by Witten in one of those papers. And you, everything is described in terms of the, of the uh, dilaton potential. It's actually useful sometimes to plot the dilaton potential and look, you can actually look at the black hole solutions. Um, there's uh, the T equals zero black hole, and then um, you, go, you go to higher temperatures in that way. And uh, you have a larger class of black holes where, for example, you mm -hmm. can have some non-trivial potential that looks like this, and you have stable black holes. The free energy um, is, uh, is, is, is greater than these guys. And the uh, 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 specific heat is positive and these are negative. Red means those solutions don't, uh, those are not black hole solutions. That's a really beautiful story from the semi-classical physics. I don't have much time to tell you about that, uh, although I will come back and flash some of these in a moment because there are beautiful things happening in the matrix model that will be somewhat mirrored by some of the semi-classical analysis, uh, depending upon how much time I have to tell you about five, it. Five minutes. Um, uh, okay. So what um, Witten and uh, uh, others showed then is that there are um, some uh, unfortunate behaviors going on in parameter space where rho goes negative. So what's going on? Might you resolve this perturbatively, non-perturbatively, or by some kind of phase transition? We have all the tools now, so let's go. So what you can see, uh, I'm mean, gonna do it in two examples. One example looks like this. And it's distinguished from the other one that I'm gonna talk about where um, this one vanishes, this potential vanishes at phi equals zero. The other one will not vanish at phi equals zero. And um, they're distinct classes for various reasons, um, both, both in supergravity and also in the matrix model. But you can write down what the expected spectral density would look like, uh, or they do. Um, and you have an expression like this. And you can see without going uh, too much into detail by just expanding, you can see that uh, for lambda above some critical value, actually uh, this thing will start going negative. So naively it has some, sorry, for the good areas of lambda, it starts out at zero, uh, but then there are problems. It's very easy to see in this example, what's going on by looking at the associated function u. So you can use the integral transform or invert the integral transform that I wrote previously write down the, the function r, which is now more general than we had before. There's a piece uh, controlled by the lambda. And if you simply look at this function, you'll see 
what's going on. <clears throat> and the problem comes because there's multi-valuedness showing up, which is not being taken into account uh, when using the integral, the integral expression. The way we saw to build the functions, uh, the spectral density, remember, is to have a single copy of U, which I've put in green, which this color coding does not correspond to the color coding of the black hole. Sorry about that. Um, uh, which comes along like this. And then at X equals zero, uh, you have the single piece like this. And you can see that for various lambdas below some critical value, I can always do that. And I have some threshold energy zero. But actually, when lambda goes above some critical value, this actually pops up like that. And so what I shouldn't be doing is integrating all the way down, including this, this blue piece here, where this thing turns over and has some multi-valuedness. So the resolution of this example is actually that there should be two expressions for the uh, spectral density. Below lambda critical, you use the expression I gave before, um, which, is, uh, um, which was perfectly fine, but you should use this expression, which uh, uh, has some threshold energy E, such that you use only the single valued piece of, 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 the, uh, of the function. And uh, so it, it's in some sense, it's a phase transition of, of some lambda to having a threshold, no threshold energy, and then a threshold energy. Very interestingly, this is actually mirrored in the semi-classical analysis of the W function in this regime. It's not exactly at the same lambda, but you can actually see that the black hole sector, the T equals zero black hole develops a non-zero phi um, above some critical value. And it's sort of an avatar, I think, of what's going, we think of what's going on in the full matrix model. Time is short, so I'm gonna move on uh, to the next example, which is a little bit more intricate, um, although it's a simpler function. And it looks like this. And if you work out the, uh, the disk level string equation, it looks like this. Uh, when I say you, I mean they did, and here it is. And again, this starts going negative uh, for reasons that are very puzzling. And again, looking at the underlying function, which is u, you can see what's going on. So here's some snapshots. I'm gonna use lambda uh, critical star to distinguish it from the previous one. You can see what happens is that some multi-valuedness begins to develop in this perturbative regime. So it actually renders the whole theory perturbatively inconsistent right at the start. Uh, ab below some lambda, it's fine. You have again, a single piece of U. Above some lambda, you can see what happens is that that threshold energy jumps to down here, but you have, you're losing some information by integrating over this folded piece of U. And you can see actually that that gives you a negative spectral density, but it actually happens even when you naively think you have a well-behaved spectral density. And then above some lambda outside, some window on the other side, everything's fine. The multi-validness goes away and you also have a nice well-defined row. So what you see by looking at the underlying matrix model function is that this negative row business is only a symptom of the true pathogen, if you don't mind me being a little bit annoyingly topical. The actual virus is not the negative going negative of rho, it's the multi-valuedness of, of u in this x less than zero regime that is producing the problem. And you can see it's fundamentally producing some breakdown of the picture that I spent uh, time building for you that basic quantum mechanics, even classically, you can see this is some quantum mechanical problem with some potential, this is some mechanical problem with some potential U. I have an ambiguity if I have some folding of the U function. If you trace U back to the recursion relations of the orthogonal polynomials, you're losing information from which the matrix model is built by having an ambiguity in the recursion coefficients that comes from this kind of folding in the U. So that is the underlying problem in all of this. Now you can actually ask whether non-perturbative physics can save you. And what we actually did is we extended uh, my non-perturbative results from my earlier papers to, to handle this sort of picture where you have now uh, a, a way of incorporating the threshold energy. It's modified, uh, extended some, some, some uh, uh, using some, some, some old papers of mine uh, and adapting it to this uh, problem here. You can now handle 
threshold energies of the kind we're talking about. And the R now is built out of the Rs that I talked about um, that we've seen in these examples. So what physics emerges non-perturbatively, and uh, time is short, so I'll, I'll be very brief here. You can expand the minimal models that these are built out of. You can extract what they are and get expressions for the T case for these deformed lambdas. Uh, the, the, these are uh, two cases. And then you can solve the equations uh, where you can. And uh, analogously to what we had then, you can see then you get a family as you get, for example, in example B, we have different threshold energies as you change lambda uh, in the good wind and outside the window where you would get multivaluedness, you can actually solve the equation, solve for the spectrum. And here are some of the spectra with different threshold energies where the spectral density uh, sol uh, starts non-perturbatively, all well behaved and very beautiful. Uh, when you are in the range where there mm. are um, uh, multi-valuedness, there are no solutions to the equation. Uh, the, the whole thing is unstable, non-perturbatively. Uh, the non-perturbative physics cannot save you. Uh, those things are perturbatively and non-perturbatively ill-defined, uh, which if you think about it uh, in retrospect, uh, is clear when you trace U back to its matrix model origins. And just to check that, you can go above the window uh, and see uh, the multivaluedness has gone away. And indeed, the equations become well behaved. Difficult to solve, but with perseverance, you can actually coax out very nice stable solutions again. So that's for example, B. And finally, for example, A, um, oh, I should say there's a, a little bit of, of what we think is an avatar of something interesting going on in the semi-classical uh, black hole picture as well, above some critical value uh, in that picture, uh, you lose the t equals zero black hole sector entirely, which is interesting. Okay, let me end by just talking about example A. Example A, uh, again, you have, if you remember uh, in that case, uh, for positive lambda, you have everything's fine until you go above some lambda and then you develop, you have a transition to a new threshold energy. And indeed you can find non-perturbative examples solutions for all of those kinds of uh, uh, behaviors. So here's a couple where they're below lambda critical, and then here's two when above lambda critical and increasing lambda, they're the spectra. And then rather spectacularly in uh, lambda less than zero regime, you they're all at the same threshold energy. But what happens is that the well begins to move, the structure evolves with lambda such that an effective non-perturbative gap develops when you solve for the full non-perturbative spectral density. There's the perturbative Schwarzschild-like result, but you actually get an exponential suppression of the energy before it begins to turn on, which is an entirely non-perturbative effect, which is very new and very interesting. We'd like to understand that better. And we think there's an avatar of that, again, in the semi-classical analysis. Again, at a slightly different value of lambda because it's a semi-classical analysis, you get this W function developing a piece where there's a jump in the semi-classical analysis telling you that there's a gap for which you do not have, um, uh, uh, you, you, you go from the good black holes there to the dominant ones being there. And then these would only contribute exponentially small in the full semi-classical quantum gravity. We think that's an analog of what's going on there. Time is, uh, has run out. So I should uh, point you to the paper where we work out all of the details and, uh, and just say, well, I hope you agree then that casting JT gravity and its deformations into this minimal string language is a very powerful tool. It gives you insights both perturbatively and non-perturbatively into what's going on uh, from the underlying matrix model. Uh, fascinating non-perturbative phenomena can, can, uh, can, uh, can emerge and uh, it's worth exploring. And clearly other deformations of other members of the JT family uh, should be explored with these tools and uh, uh, will no doubt learn a lot. So uh, apologies for running over a little bit and I will stop. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can all thank Clifford for a beautiful talk. Uh, we do have time for a few uh, questions. Uh, the first question is uh, Pingao, why don't you unmute yourself please? Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the talk. I uh, basically have two questions. The first question is, um, uh, in the X positive region, uh, you, uh, you you just define the UX, um, the, the potential uh, to be 
uh, like exponentially closing to the horizontal, horizontal axis. But um, uh, is there any reason why you choose this one or is this choice arbitrary or like could we have other choices and get a different, that, does that correspond to a different uh, definition of a non-perturbative non physics? And the second question, oh yeah, you may ask a first, you may answer first a question, yeah, sorry. Okay, so, um, so, uh... Uh, I, I like to play devil's advocate here and go, well, no, well, first of all, no, I didn't choose this. Uh, there's a matrix model, which has uh, uh, an expansion in terms of surfaces for which I can then actually do the non perturbative limit, the, the, sorry, do the double skating limit and get uh, surfaces. So I know that I'm really working with the theory of surfaces and then out this comes, I didn't put that in as it were. So those are the complex matrix models. So there are other games you could play to modify this, uh, this region, um, which aren't necessarily guided by a matrix model. And uh, so, you know, I'm saying this isn't arbitrary and you could go, well, why choose complex matrix models? And my response would be, well, why did you choose Hermitian matrix models in the first place? There was no reason to choose those in the first place. And uh, so this is in some sense, just as good um, uh, a, a starting point. Just historically, we started playing with Hermitian matrices because you know we were interested in uh, what Wigner taught us about nuclear physics. But ultimately, for describing surfaces, nothing tells you that you should start with Hermitian matrix model. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the, uh, my second question is uh, that all the tool you developed uh, apply to like a multi-cut matrix model solution, or is only applies to one cut case? That's a really excellent question. A lot of the technology, uh, like uh, like uh, like this thing, and uh, and uh, yeah, you know, and of course the associated function U become more complicated. I'm not even sure how fully worked out it is in uh, in in multi-cut cases. That quant the, the, that quantum mechanics, uh, I, I, there's more to be done, as far as I understand. I would love to know the answer. Uh, my understanding is is that. Uh, so much of the structure I told you depends on it being the one cut um, uh, structure, but some of it will uh, generalize, but uh, well, this, this, is not, this isn't the place for the details. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Julian, do you want to unmute yourself? I, I think I'm on, I think you unmuted me. Can yeah, you hear okay. me? Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks Clifford, uh, very interesting talk. Uh, risking to reveal that I might have misunderstood the crucial point. Is there a way of talking about what you said using continuum language, meaning like uh, thinking about it as Liouville theory plus some, uh, you know, minimal CFT? Uh, that, that's a great question. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how much you can see. Uh, it, well, it depends on which aspect you're talking about. Um, so, uh, I don't know how to formulate that non-perturbatively, for example. So I, I, I wouldn't know how to get at non-perturbative questions. All I, the only way I know how to do that is using the matrix model. Um, but what we've seen in this example here is that even before you go to non-perturbative physics, you can see that there's a non-perturbative sickness in, uh, because of the folding of U, uh, of U zero. So maybe you're asking me whether one might see that in the continuum theory. And I think that's a really great, great question. I think, uh, I think there are two distinct cases. I think it's already obvious that there's a problem, of course, when, when rho of E is less than zero, and that will clearly show up in the continuum theory um, uh, you know, as, a form, as some form of non-unitarity. But I think, uh, as we said, uh, our observation is that you can have perfectly fine looking rows of E, row of E's, but still have this multi-valuedness. And the matrix model tells you that uh, the, con the continuum theory is broken. Um, what I suspect has happened, will, will, will happen, I, I haven't done a calculation to test this, is that there'll still be a sickness in the continuum theory perturbatively that will probably show up perhaps as some break, some failure of some ward identities or something like that telling you that some internal consistency has broken down in perturbation theory, but you wouldn't necessarily see it uh, working surface by surface with, uh, with just um, some, some, some simple operator. It might be that you have to look at some correlation functions or ward identities. That's my guess. I see, thanks. Also, um, Emil has uh, given partially an answer to what I was asking as well. 
uh, okay, thank you. I think I think that's that's enough. I might I might ask you something more in private, but thanks a lot, Clifford. Sure. And Emil. Okay, one last question from Edward. Edward, can you unmute yourself? So just for clarity, Clifford, in model A, what is your uh -huh. D phase transition? The threshold energy jumps, but it's still a one cut model. Is that yes, it's yes, it is. It's still a one cut model. The threshold energy jumps, and so um, what you have is essentially yeah, uh, is essentially you're you're going from some uh, you're, you're going from some model like that to some to some model like that. Now the you know the it seems it seems uh, that uh, as I said trying to understand what this phase transition is from the point of view of the gravity theory, as some would like to understand more. But as I said, an avatar of this is that the, 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 in the black hole picture, you're going from having, you're going from having um, black holes that have t equals zero where phi is zero to black holes where there's some non-zero phi um, at the t in the t equals zero sector, which is a nice sort of transition uh, to explore. And the matrix model seems to be catching, capturing it uh, fully in this language. Uh, just one small comment is that just in the world of matrix models, since it is possible to have multi-cut matrix models, it should be possible to find a model that would do that, I guess. Um, well, I, I would say that, um, uh, uh, you mean that to generate multiple cuts? Yes. Um, yes, I, I, I would like to understand how, if one can, within this language, describe uh, a transition and follow the transition where you go from having one cut to having multiple cuts. I don't think this is that. This is, it, it, you know, the cut moves as it were, but it's, it's still one cut. So yes, I agree that that kind of transition should be possible as well. I just don't know, certainly in restricting to this, to this language where you have this nice toy quantum mechanics that you project things out of, I don't know whether it can do that. Uh, I, I'd like to explore that. Okay, thank you. Okay, one question uh, from Juan. Do you wanna unmute yourself? Yeah, so in the case of uh, JT gravity where you have the correspondence to the Hermitian matrix model, so that, her, that Hermitian matrix then could be interpreted as the Hamiltonian of some quantum system. Yes. Now, in, in your case, uh, you said you, in the end, you, will, you prefer to consider the complex matrix model, right? Um, uh, certainly, it seems, uh, it seems better behave non-perturbatively, yeah. Right, right. So th does that mean we lose, the, uh, we lose this quantum mechanical interpretation on the boundary in terms of a Hermitian matrix? I mean, you know, we don't have a... Aha, uh -huh. Hamiltonian now, or what? what is there Great. any interpretation? Great question. So uh, two uh, two things. Uh, okay, time is short. So let me let me give you an answer that'll make you happy, uh, um, which is that you can also, and this again goes back to work of mine with collaborators in the uh, in the early nineties. There's a different way. Once you realize what's going on, essentially the complex matrix model, the complex matrix model is of some complex matrix M and the potential really is of, of, of M dagger M. And essentially the, that nice positivity of the eigenvalues is controlled by the fact that, you know, it, it, that's the form of the potential. So the eigenvalues just can't help but, but sort of butt up against the wall at, at, uh, at, at, uh, at equal zero. And that's what essentially corrects that potential that I drew earlier um, to having this nice capping off in that way. That's the function u, lots of curves here that look the same. Um, in retrospect, what you can do is you can go, actually, that tells me a different way that I can fix the Hermitian matrix model, which is I can go back to the original Hermitian matrix model where I, I have a model of some, uh, a, a, some matrix H and I can actually put in by hand a boundary condition corresponding to a wall at some place. And then you can actually uh, uh, incorporate the physics of that wall, including the, the ability to move that wall around, which corresponds to changing the threshold energy, and uh, derive the matrix, derive that same string equation that I told you about, that one that looks like this. You will actually get the same string equation that you get from the complex matrix models by 
inserting a wall by hand uh, into the Hermitian matrix model. So if you like, you can then think of it in, in the picture that you like, you can say, I still have the Hermitian matrix model plus this non-perturbative regulator um, that you've put in by hand. I prefer to, uh, to uh, have both pictures in mind so that it doesn't look like I've gone in and sort of messed with the model in some arbitrary way. It really came from a well-defined uh, matrix model that I do have a, a random surface interpretation of. And I can see then that I'm just borrowing that and bringing it back to the emission matrix model. So maybe that uh, okay. it makes you Thank feel you. better. <laughs> um, there's another question, uh, Steve, do you wanna unmute yourself? Yes, yeah. Hi, Clifford. Uh, uh, Hi. One issue with putting in a wall like this is, is there's some use uh, that people have found for eigenvalues to the left of that wall. I mean, uh -huh. uh, in the negative region, for instance, the, the one eigenvalue instantons that seem to represent the effects of ZZ brains uh -huh. respond to eigenvalues sitting in the forbidden region. And in, in this, like for instance, those can be used to describe the large order behavior of perturbation theory. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> is the result that you get, have you explored the Borel summability of uh, your, your model? It seems like, uh, an, is there a natural candidate uh, for like the saddle points that would describe the singularities in the Borel transform yes. that are typically attributed to one eigenvalue instantons? Yes, uh, it's all there and a uh, uh, ra rather beautiful story. Again, uh, I, I worked this all out um, with, uh, with, you know, this, this, is all, this is all my thesis work back in the early 90s. And, and it is all there. Now, now you, you might wonder uh, um, uh, if, you, if, if these things are perturbatively the same, that same instanton should be there, you might say. And yeah. so uh, how come the instability went away? And the point is, is that people often mix up the instanton associated with the non-Borel summability with the instanton corresponding to the tunneling away to, in, to, uh, to, to oblivion. And the two are not the same. They coincide, uh, uh, um, but they, 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 they are not the same. The way of thinking about where the instanton is in this picture um, goes back to, uh, uh, if I go back to the complex matrix model, for example, um, and I think, naturally in terms of, so I'm working with this thing M, M dagger and I have this positive only spectrum, but there's a way in some ways of taking a square root of this. You know, uh, it's in some ways the natural things are these lambda squareds and I can sort of unsquare root of this and think of it as, as a symmetric problem. And then what you see, the instanton you're looking for is the familiar one, which is just the two well instanton, which lives, you can think of as naturally supported at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the origin. So going back to the wall picture, what you have is you can compute the uh, effective potential. There's the, uh, there's the usual eigenvalue problem. You can compute the effective potential for one eigenvalue, which is the thing that's controlling the whole story. And normally for the Hermitian matrix model, the, the effective potential for the one matrix model, uh, for the one eigenvalue, just plotting that in green, um, looks something like this and it's back here at negative energy at the top of that. Um, the analogous object here is, it lives here. I see, it's like an endpoint. Uh, it, it's, it's an like endpoint. An end, yeah, it, it, it's sort of, it's sort of in the doubled picture then, uh, drawing too many things on this diagram. If I, if I now continue that to be the effective potential in the uh, two well problem, it looks like this and then like that. So you've got a lump there and that's where the eigenvalue sits. And indeed it has lower action, this one. And so you can actually now go and do the summability problem, just looking at the differential equations itself. And you see that there are two instantons, there's this one, but there's another instanton solution. You compute its action and you'll find it's precisely this height at the, at the, at the wall there. And so all of, the, all of the elements that you so beautifully uh, described in the emission models way back there are present in these models too. It's just a bit richer. Okay, thank you. And they do also correspond to ZZ brains and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, but there's, 
uh, uh, a whole bunch of papers from the old days on that. All right, I've taken over from Rob, who had to step away from the computer for a second. Uh, I don't see any more questions. I guess we've had a, a lot already. So uh, let's all thank Clifford again for the really nice talk. Thanks, Something everyone. Great everyone. questions. Um, oh, Steve, do you still have another question? I think Steve's hand is still raised. So let oh, me sure. see if he, if he has. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself, Steve? No, I just forgot to unmute. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. No more questions. Good. Okay. All thanks, right. everyone. Well, thanks again, Clifford. Uh, thank uh, all the speakers of today. It was a very nice session. I will stop the recording now.